I'm really happy to see each one of you here. You guys have been faithful coming out, and I, I hope it's been really beneficial to you in your personal lives. I get a lot of feedback during the week from people who talk to me about how they like this or didn't like that, and I really appreciate that. So, you know, email me if you want to give me more feedback. I really enjoy that. So thank you. Um, let me just introduce Dr. David Snow to you. Dr. David Snow is a distinguished professor of sociology at the University of California, Irvine, which he joined in 2001. He taught previously at Southern Methodist University, where I also went, used their library, the Perkins Library, um, the University of Texas, Austin, and the University of Arizona, where he was head of the Department of Sociology for nine years. He earned a BA from Ohio University, an MA in Urban Studies from the University of Akron, and his PhD in Sociology from UCLA. His teaching and research interests include social protest and movements, socioeconomic marginality with an emphasis on homelessness and poverty, social psychology focusing on changes in cognitive orientation and interpretive perspectives, that's a mouthful, <clears throat> with an emphasis on framing processes, conversion, and identity work, and then religion and the persistence of belief. He is the author of, and co-author of over 100 articles and chapters on these various topics and of 10 books. Professor Snow is past president of the Society for the Study of Symbolic Interaction and the Pacific Sociological Association and vice president of the American Sociological Association. He has been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study and the Behavior Sci Sciences at Stanford, a recipient of the Society for the Study of Social Problems 2008 Lee Founders Award for Career Contributions to the Study of Social Problems, the UCI Alumni Association's 2012 Faculty Achievement Award, the 2013 John D. McCarthy Award for Lifetime Achievement, every year he's got an award, it looks like here, um, in the Scholarship of Social Movements and Collective Behavior, and the 2016 George Herbert Mead Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Society for the Study of Symbolic Interaction. Professor Snow led the recent study of the cost of homelessness in Orange County in collaboration with OC United Way and Jamboree Housing. Please welcome Dr. David Snow. Good morning. I mean, I'll ask you again, how, how are you all doing? I hope it's great. I'm going to be joining uh, most of you before too long because I'm retiring at the end of, uh, end of June, and I assume most of you are retired. So uh, I'll begin experimenting with the stage of life that, uh, that uh, you are in. Uh, and I wouldn't uh, put too much stock in uh, the awards that were mentioned. My experience as you approach retirement, you tend to get more of these kind of recognitions. Uh, so they kind of are what they are. Anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, to talk with you about uh, homelessness. Uh, I've been studying homelessness in the U.S. and actually abroad uh, since the early 1980s. Some of you may recall that uh, about 1982, 83, all of a sudden homelessness kind of came online again in the, uh, in the U.S. And how I got involved, I was at the University of Texas then, and uh, the mayor's office called the university to see if somebody might help them out figuring out who all these people were on the running trails and so forth. Uh, they were sleeping rough outside and thus began my kind of quasi career in studying homelessness. And that particular study mushroomed into a much larger study that produced a book called Down on Their Luck, a study of homeless street people. And since then, uh, you know, once you get on a horse sometimes, metaphorically, it's not your choice whether you get off. And uh, I've been pulled into studying homelessness uh, for much of my career since then. And that's how this study emerged on the cost of homelessness in Orange County. 
Uh, as you know, in reading the newspapers and probably watching uh, some TV, uh, homelessness is an issue uh, in, uh, around the country, but it also in Orange County. One big question that cities have begun to ask in municipalities, what's the cost of homelessness? I mean, we can talk about the cost of homelessness in a moral sense. We can talk about the cost of homelessness from a humanitarian standpoint, but what's the cost in terms of dollars and cents? And how I got involved in this, uh, Orange County United Way, Jamboree Housing, uh, which is a housing corporation that builds uh, low-income housing. It's throughout the state, but also has an operation in Orange County. And a number of other organizations went to UCI, uh, administration at UCI, went to the dean of the College of Social Sciences, and that dean came to me. And so I put together a study team, and Dr. Goldberg is a colleague of mine, and she's a demographer and statistician. And I'm not a statistician. Uh, I do field work, uh, what anthropologists often call ethnography. So my early work on homelessness was my student research, and I spent 500 hours on the streets uh, getting to kind of know people personally. Uh, but for this study, uh, we needed somebody uh, who does demography and statistics. And so uh, Dr. Goldberg uh, and I worked together, and we had several graduate students that helped out as, uh, as researchers. But before we get into study, let me... All right, let me, uh, kind of when you see a picture like that, what is it that you see? What comes to mind? Down and out. Down and out. Anything else? I mean, clearly, that's where he sleeps, makeshift bed. Pardon? Unwanted. Unwanted. Oh, a Mexican mustache. Okay. What about this other one? The family, yeah. A little baby in a cardboard box. A mother and father hovering over it. This gentleman here. He's clearly of the retiree age. Pardon? Disabled, absolutely. And I actually interviewed that gentleman. <clears throat> and I'll come back to him later on. And over here, hungry, somebody said desperation. Pardon? Dumpster diver. Who said that? How'd you, how'd you come up with that phrase? It is popular, and it's one that the homeless use themselves. It's interesting. I remember in, in Austin, we interviewed this fellow who was part of a small encampment, and the people in the encampment had different roles. And uh, there was one... One guy, uh, he called himself Gypsy Bill, and I, we asked him what he's really good at. He says, oh, I'm an expert dumpster diver. He says, in, in our group, he says, we each have different roles, and I'm the one that goes into the dumpsters. I can get in easily because I'm small, but I've also developed a skill for knowing kind of right off what's edible and what's not. And, of course, if you don't have money to buy food, that's a pretty handy skill to have. Well, anyway, I just put these up to, these are different views and uh, uh, images of a uh, homeless uh, in different places. Uh, the interesting thing to keep in mind, too, one thing I've noticed, and 
I've studied homelessness in Sao Paulo, Brazil, in Tokyo, in Paris, Los Angeles, of course, Orange County, uh, Tucson, in Austin, uh, some work in Philadelphia, Detroit. So I've seen homeless basically all over the world and talk with them. And the interesting thing, if you don't see something about a particular country, they all look the same. This is a homeless gentleman in Los Angeles. This is a homeless family under a bridge in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, this is a homeless fellow at the Newport Beach Transit Center. And uh, this is a fellow uh, going through the dumpster in Los Angeles. But you could substitute Paris, Tokyo, wherever, and they'd all look the same. So there is some commonality to the lifestyle. So let's turn to this cost study. And the objective, I had said something about the objective to get at the cost of homelessness, but it's not just the cost of be, living on the streets, what's the cost of living on the streets in comparison to living in these different kinds of housing configurations? And I'll tell you about those, the differences in those configurations in a minute. Uh, I mean, you, you can kind of understand the point of doing that uh, if you put somebody in permanent supportive housing, which provides wraparound health care, is that cost the same as leaving that person on the street? Does it cost more or does it cost less? So if you can answer that question, you can begin to get a sense of the cost of homelessness. The other objective was to put together a profile of the demographic and biographic characteristics of the homeless. Uh, and to also address the causes of homelessness. But first, we probably need to have some clarity in terms of how do we define homelessness. All of us recognize the first one, people living and sleeping in public or private places not attended for human habitation. And, of course, that was the case with the four pictures. People sleeping in shelters, they're overnight shelters. Uh, people living in vehicles, sleeping in vehicles, evicted from their homes, or discharged from a hospital, a prison, a jail. The, in, Housing and urban development uh, in Washington, D.C. defines homelessness in terms of the first uh, four categories. Our way of thinking is it's a little more expansive because people doubling up, living in temporary, transitional, and supportive housing. I mean, technically, they're not on the streets, but they've just come from the streets. And the housing is not yet permanent. Then we have other kind of housing. Uh, living in makeshift substandard housing. You've probably seen pictures of, they're called favelas in the South American cities, but particularly in Brazil, uh, in Sao Paulo, in Rio de Janeiro, on the hillsides. And so typically, these are makeshift housing arrangements of people who've come in from the rural areas. Uh, and they just take construction throwaway materials. Uh, it, it could be uh, construction plastics. It could be uh, plywood. It could be uh, uh, bricks, whatever, and put something together. In many cities around the world, uh, those kind of arrangements are left standing. Uh, in the U.S., I mean, I think most of you know what happens when there's something that looks like a tent city that 
begins to persist for a while, the bulldozers come in. So we don't really have anything uh, quite like this. Uh, we hear a lot on the news about refugee, and of course disaster uh, victims are homeless, not always permanently, but would fall into that category. Certainly refugees, and that's a crisis worldwide, itinerant groups like gypsies and some nomads and people living in squats or squatting communities. One thing to, to think about, and we won't see it in our future, that is because I don't imagine most of us are gonna be living till the middle of this current century, but the world population today, as you know, is around 7 billion. The estimate uh, to the middle of the century, at least 10 billion. And, the, and also keep in mind, in as much as there's real substance to global warming, by the middle of the century, as the seas get a, begin to get a little higher, it will push particularly low-income people off of coastal communities in, in countries like India, uh, making them refugees. So the refugee population in the world will increase. Uh, hence, homelessness will increase. In fact, one estimate is that uh, the, of the 7 billion people today, maybe 1.5 to 2 might fall under the broad category of homelessness. Uh, by the middle of the century, that proportion will increase more than the proportion of the population overall. So it's not an issue that's going away right away. So I indicated uh, a couple terms to keep in mind as we proceed. Uh, the different kinds of housing, the emergency shelter, the overnight. <clears throat> There's a lot of discussion in Orange County about building a shelter here, a shelter there. Shelterization is not the solution to homelessness. Shelters are just what they are overnight accommodations. It's not permanent housing. And oftentimes people, you know, they go into the shelter at seven at night, maybe pushed out at six in the morning. Uh, some have adjusted their schedules in some way, but it's not any kind of permanent solution. What it's a solution to is giving people to stay, particularly in inclement weather, uh, a roof over their head. And it gets people out of the eyesight of regular citizens. I mean, I would, I would say most people aren't too concerned about the homeless so long as they're not in their eyesight. Uh, if we can't see them, then we don't have to worry about them. That's not true of everyone, but it is the case with many. Then there's bridge housing or transitional, which is usually about six months, help people get on their feet, rapid rehousing, are for families, primarily families, it's usually uh, mothers and a child or two uh, who have fallen on hard times due to, it could be eviction, uh, an increase in rent, but not a corresponding increase in wages. It could be job loss. It could be some medical emergency that they can't pay for. So they're out on the streets and rapid rehousing uh, is to kind of provide them a cushion to get back on their feet and into the job market. So it's not permanent. Uh, one of the uh, major rapid rehousing providers uh, in Orange County and Irvine is Family, Family Forward. And some of you may have heard of Family uh, Forward. Then there's permanent supportive housing, which is for the uh, chronic homeless here. And as I said, it provides uh, it provides, along with housing, the supportive services that the chronic homeless need. So who are the chronic homeless? These are people who have been on the streets for a year or more uh, and who have uh, several disabilities. The gentleman in the wheelchair 
was, of course, chronically homeless. He'd been homeless in Orange County for 17 years. Uh, so you can keep these uh, terms in mind. So how did we do this study? Uh, <clears throat> we're interested in the costs here in the middle. And so what are the different institutions or organizations uh, that costs are going to accrue? Well, one are the municipalities. Uh, Orange County, you know, has 34 municipalities. Uh, no real flagship city like Los Angeles or San Diego or San Francisco. Anaheim's the largest one, but uh, it's not really a flagship city. And then you have hospitals with ERs. There's at least 20 of them uh, with ERs in Orange County. And the homeless will use those facilities. Non-governmental agencies. So these would include all the faith-based agencies and other kind of agencies in Orange County. And then the county itself. And so what we wanted to do is go to all of these clusters or institutional clusters and uh, try to see what's being spent. We sent uh, design questionnaires for the municipalities, for the hospitals, and for non-governmental agencies. And uh, the county provided us with uh, uh, their statements in terms of what they expect. But what we also wanted to know to really drill down and find out about the cost, we interviewed uh, over 250 homeless individuals. And these interviews uh, took a probably average of about 45 minutes. Uh, so there were a lot of questions that were asked. One question uh, we'd ask is, OK, in the past months or six months, how, how many times have you used this, have you used these services and what's the frequency? So in my, an emergency room, how often? Uh, hospitalization, how often? Uh, some kind of health clinic, how often? Uh, soup kitchen, how often? So uh, the individual in a wheelchair, uh, during a six months period. He was in an emergency room 12 times. That also includes 12 emergency room transports. So the, what's the average cost of an emergency room uh, transport? Well, we got those figures from uh, Uh, ambulance providers in the county and got an average cost. Uh, what's the uh, cost of an emergency room visit? Well, close to the average cost at that time, close to $1,000. And hospitalization. Anyway, he was in emergency room 12 times in six months period, hospitalized five times. And the interesting thing about the homeless when they're hospitalized is their average length of stay in the hospital is longer than for uh, citizens like us. I mean, it, you know, today they try to get you out pretty quickly, but it's hard to do with the homeless because they have to have some place to go. So we found their average length of hospitalization was 10 days, 10 nights. And you know how those hospital costs accrue. So we, we did interviews since we wanted to do comparisons, interviewed people in the streets, in shelters, and in each of these kind of housing. And through these two together, uh, we could derive an estimate of the cost of uh, homelessness in the county. Uh, I'm not going to belabor this, but for example, uh, if you're going to, for, for different agencies, we went to this a, uh, organization in Orange County, but it's statewide. It's called 211. How many of you know of 211? Some of you. Yeah, if you have a problem, you can call 211, and it'll connect you. And 211 uh, has, is connected to about 600 
organizations that can provide various services, not all for the homeless. So we went through all of these and discerned about 246 of them had some kind of contact with homelessness. It may not have been the only thing they did. And then we organized them in terms of uh, the character of the health services, ambulance providers, soup kitchen, uh, the kind of housing, and so on, and made sure we, uh, uh, we took a sample of around 11 agencies in, in each of these, and uh, all total, uh, we came out to getting data on 116 uh, 16 agencies. So that's how we got the cost from the agencies. Now, to, to show you in, the, uh, in terms of the interviews, we were basically all over the county. Uh, the Civic Center, which had in Santa Ana, a uh, large encampment, the Santa Ana Riverbed, which no longer exists, uh, Share Ourselves in Costa Mesa, Lions Park, Hot Heart Park, and uh, Lions Park in Costa Mesa, Hart Park in Orange, Family Assistance Ministry, South County, Newport uh, Transit Center, Friendship Shelter is in Laguna Beach. Uh, so interviews, and then these are all of people in the streets, and then interviews with people in these different kind of housing clusters. Some of these names you may recognize in uh, housing clusters, the shelter that we did interview, the transitional interim, a wise place is for women. Uh, build futures uh, is for younger people, 18 to 24. Uh, Families Forward, I mentioned. Salvation Army, you know about. Colette's Children's Home is in uh, Huntington Beach, and it's for uh, homeless women and, uh, and children. And these are the various... You, you go down here, and they're primarily uh, two major providers of permanent supportive housing, uh, Jamboree Housing and Mercy House. So... We try, you, you, you cannot uh, do what's so-called a, a random or representative sample of the homeless because you don't know what the population parameters are. But what we tried to do is identify so-called hotspots and where we know we're going to find homeless and focus on those spots. So all of that, uh, we were able to come up with uh, this demographic profile of who the homeless are in Orange County. If you look at the total in red over here, on the right, um, you see the first one, U.S. born. 90% of them are born in the U.S. Uh, U.S. citizens, and that kind of counteracts a stereotype that a significant number of the homeless are folks that have come into the uh, country illegally uh, and they're not our citizens. That's not the case. The second one, right here, nearly 70% have lived in Orange County for 10 years or more. Again, that counters the stereotype that, oh, they're just coming in from other places to enjoy the nice weather. You know, I haven't looked at it, but my guess is for 10 years or more, that may be a longer time in the county than the average resident. Uh, the point is they're, or they're Orange County residents. They're uh, our citizens. What about in terms of uh, race and ethnicity, 47% white? 30% uh, Latinx, 15% black. Orange County is about 35% uh, Latino, Latina. Uh, today, they, that's called Latinx. Uh, but about 35%, you could say 30% here, pretty close, maybe a little underrepresented. Uh, but in terms of uh, African-American blacks, 15%, but the county's only 2%. So, uh, 
black residents are highly overrepresented. That's not unusual. In any city you look at in the U.S., uh, blacks, Americans, will be overrepresented among the homeless. Uh, Latinos, uh, not typically overrepresented. Median age, 50. Uh, that struck us as we were a little surprised it was that. But then on the other hand, it may not be surprising given that the, our population is aging anyway. A couple of these to look at. Live alone, 67%. Now, of course, as we get older, uh, how many of you live alone in here? Yeah, there's a handful of you. And, of course, that often happens uh, as we get older. And a, a spouse or partner passes on. Uh, but in, in comparison to adult American, that's very high. 17% uh, uh, live with children. Only 6% uh, are married. If you take those three together, there's this concept in the social sciences called social capital. Social capital very simply has to do with your social ties. How well networked are you? How many people can you depend on? One thing we know, if social capital increases, illness decreases, depression decreases. As social capital increases, health well-being increases. So you look at these and you can say one thing the homeless suffer, uh, social capital deficits. And that's one of, the, one of several reasons that ties into health care. Uh, Less than a high school degree, 19%. Uh, you might expect more. For Orange County, less than a high school degree is probably around 5.6%. Uh, for the U.S. as a whole, only around 6%. Uh, so clearly, uh, more folks uh, among the homeless without a high school degree. Also, uh, percent that worked with a paycheck, uh, only for, for five years ago, 49%. So, you know, economists talk about human capital. Human capital has to do with education and work experience. The homeless also uh, suffer from human capital deficit. Chronic homeless, we said uh, time on the street, uh, 42% have been three years or more, certainly chronically homeless. Uh, it's also interesting that a number, of 50, over half have been homeless two or more times. What does that mean? They get off the street, but they come back on the street. So again, we're talking about people of really marginal means, limited social capital. They might find their way off the street, but all you need is a little increase in rent, uh, a health problem, and you don't have the income, and you're back on the streets. And so you, you could say the majority of homeless are serial homeless, meaning they're on and off the streets. Something here that is of relevance to us, 46% uh, say uh, they're in poor health. Well, it's actually... Uh, it's not just poor health, but so-so and poor health. Uh, when, and that question was modeled after question, the very same question that are, is asked of national health surveys. When you ask domiciled adult citizens the answer of fair to poor health is only 9%. Even among domiciled Americans living in poverty, it's only 22%. But here among the homeless, 46%. And 
and uh, 18% in terms of uh, depression. So that provides you a little background on who the homeless are in Orange County, and their characteristics are not that much different than in uh, other places. So let's turn to some features of living on the streets. First one, uh, where do they get their cash? Uh, from a monetary basis. So, you know, have they worked in the last 30 days? Well, uh, here you see the, the ones that work is what we expected. They're living in rapid rehousing. They're able to work. They have some job skill, and rapid rehousing helps them get right back into the labor market. Also, you see more of that in transitional and interim housing, but much different for those in shelters and living on the streets. Uh, let's see, go down to, let's go down here to median turn, uh, earnings. Median earnings, uh, monthly uh, $500 uh, for on the streets to over here, 1958 for rapid rehousing. That's because they're in the labor market. And neither people who were just recently homeless but have gotten into this kind of housing, which helps them get back on their feet and into the labor market. But overall, averaging 860. Well, you know, you can't do anything with that, particularly in Orange County, which is one of the uh, 10 highest uh, real estate and rental markets in the country. Okay, so I will kind of walk you through this. Where does the income come from? It's not great, but uh, what do they rely on? Well, the major one is food stamps. And you can see for the street here, uh, over 50% are recipients of food stamps. Interestingly, as you move into some housing, uh, it gets people connected to food stamps. Whereas the folks on the streets or in the shelters, yeah, they use food stamps, but not to the same extent as uh, people in uh, transitional housing and rapid rehousing. Shadow work, what's shadow work? Uh, shadow work is what I call work that exists within the shadows of regular work. Regular work is what presumably all of you did prior to retirement. Uh, what I'm doing is regular work. Uh, it's work that, uh, in which pay and location of what you do is regularized. It's bureaucratized. This is not regular work. What does it include? Well, people standing on freeway exits, on intersections, flying signs. Uh, people looking through dumpsters and garbage cans for plastic bottles or cans they can sell. Sometimes they, I mean, more often than not, they're taking a, a, a place that collects those things and they get some cash for it. Uh, sometimes they're fine stuff in dumpsters and cans that they're trying to sell at a flea market. Selling drugs. Even street prostitution. When I was doing research in Austin, Texas, one day I was crossing a bridge uh, across the river in Austin and a fellow crosses the street and propositioned me. And, uh, you know, I talked with him about what he was doing. Uh, I wasn't interested in the proposition, of course. Uh, but... Uh, it's another way, if somebody would be, maybe to earn uh, a little bit of extra cash. So there's a whole range of things that they do that are not regular work, uh, that fall under uh, the umbrella of shadow work. And you can see that uh, close to 80% of the street people have engaged in shadow work. 
Employment is highest among the, those in transitional and rapid rehousing, as we would suspect. Uh, different social security uh, disabilities here. Family and friends uh, provide some, but not much. Again, because the ties are limited, or those who they are tied to don't have a lot to give them anyway. And social security is down here. Social Security, I'll tell you a story. I interviewed a woman, uh, African-American woman, at the transit center in Newport Beach. It was a really nice uh, Saturday morning, probably about 10.30, and uh, I asked her where she was going. She was going down to Dana Point, and I asked her, what are you going to do in Dana Point? And she said, well, I just thought I'd go down there and enjoy the beach. And I asked her, where was she coming from? And she said, Anaheim. And I said, do you live in Anaheim? She said, well, there's a bench there in Anaheim that I sleep on during the week. Now, we continued the discussion, and she received $1,000 a month from Social Security. But that was it. Uh, and that alone is not going to get her into housing uh, and provide her for her food. But what she does is she would sleep on a bench during the week. On weekends, she would use that money, go to a motel, stay in the motel for two nights, wash her clothes, of course, shower, and get a couple of good night's sleeps. She also said she's learned all the different inexpensive restaurants along the coast, along the coast and back to Anaheim. So with that $1,000, she's figured out a way to subsist and kind of make do, uh, and, you know, on a Saturday afternoon, she was doing what a lot of people like to do is go joy, enjoy, the, uh, enjoy the beach by just hanging out there and, and walking around. But anyway, these are the various sources that their income uh, comes from. Some other characteristics you can ask yourself, uh, within the past... Uh, past months, uh, how, how often have you been verbally harassed? Well, 29% of the homeless say yes. Hit, slap, punch, kicked uh, while homeless, 8%. Uh, had something stolen while homeless, 37% have. Had things taken with them under duress or the threat of violence, 4%. Uh, again, these are things that most of us have never experienced. Or if we have, it's really been a rarity, and because of its rarity, it's been very shocking and traumatizing. But it's not an uncommon experience when you're living on the streets. Something else, ask yourself, so this is annualized, the average these are contacts with the criminal justice system. So number of times uh, ticketed, on the average for those 252 we interviewed, 3.58 times. How many of you have been ticketed that many times this uh, past year? And the, the ticketing here, we're not talking about driving cars. We're talking about uh, uh, maybe sleeping on a bench, uh, drinking, uh, uh, in an area, public area where drinking's not allowed, uh, relieving yourself publicly. You get ticketed for those sorts of things. Well, what happens when you get ticketed? You're supposed to go to homeless court. Some go, some don't. Uh, probably the majority uh, don't go. If you don't go, you're going to get fined. And if you do go, you're going to get fined. Uh, times arrested. Well, a little less than uh, arrested and is, is different, is more serious. Nights in a holding cell. Uh, uh, be mainly jail. Uh, 2.53 times uh, on average during the course of the year. So this is also part of the experience of being homeless and the risk of, uh, that, that goes with being homeless of having more contacts with the criminal justice system. Some other things. Uh, 
And they, here we're looking at the comparison of, of living on the streets with living in permanent supportive housing. And how these experiences are so dramatically different. And so you keep in mind what happens when people move into housing. So had trouble getting things done because of alcohol or drugs last month. 22% of the people on the streets, 13 sheltered, none here, 10% in permanent supportive housing. Remember, permanent supportive housing, again, are for the chronic homeless who have multiple health issues that could also include drugs and alcohol. If you're in permanent supportive housing, neither of those are allowed, but you can still have problems uh, from its persistence. Uh, difficulty finding a safe place to sleep. Well, about 50%, that's understandable. 2% here. Uh, finding a place to shower and wash, not just shower and wash, 56%. Of course, you wouldn't have that here. Difficult getting clean clothes, 40%, 12 there. Uh, finding a toilet. I mean, we probably all struggled with that at one point or another. Uh, but this is a permanent feature of life on the streets. And feeling good about yourself uh, and how that improves. And we know depression and declines when you're in housing. So these are also some... Uh, ongoing characteristics of the experience of living on the streets. Something else that shouldn't be surprising is, uh, if we look at here, 50% uh, of those who've been on the streets for less than 12 months have no health conditions. As time increases, only 29% haven't held health conditions. And you go from 15% who have three or more conditions to 33% that have three or more conditions. But if you add these two together, you can see how time on the street increases, uh, health disabilities increase with time on the street. That's very important because we're gonna see shortly that uh, <coughs> health factors uh, is a driving is a driving force between, uh, of the cost of homelessness. And so in doing something about homeless, of course, you want to get these folks off the street because they have the most serious problems. But you can't ignore these folks either because the longer on, they're on the streets, their health condition or situation will decline. And in one final thing here in terms of uh, kind of aspects, characteristics of living on the street. And we asked them, what do they find most challenging about living on the street? Is it the physical challenges or is it psychological challenges? And what did we find here for men? Uh, of course, here the yellow is a combination of the two. But the physical is in the orange. The psychological is in the red. In all cases, the psychological challenge is greater than the physical. Now, to all of you have probably heard when you went to school or later of uh, Maslow's Hierarchy of needs. I'm in the process of working with Dr. Goldberg on a paper that calls that into question. And it's based on my years of research on homelessness. You know, the idea is that you got there's this base, this pyramid, and you have to take care of like housing and food needs first before there's certain psychological, I mean, at the top he had this thing called self actualization, but even other psychological needs before then. But what does this say? The psychological side of it is persistent. It's there right with the physical. And it's even more trying for people than the physical. 
And, you know, it's, it's like saying, oh, my God, what am I doing in this situation? So that's, I think, an interesting finding, and uh, we're working on an article uh, on that because we think it's an important finding. So now you have some background on who the homeless are and some of the characteristics of living on the streets. Let's turn to the causes of homelessness. Well, how many of you played the game of musical chairs? Everybody's played it. And if you even haven't played it, you know what the game is. Well, when I talk about the causes of homelessness, I like to get people to think of the game of musical chairs. And ask yourself two questions. What causes the chairs to be removed? And what determines who's left standing? Substitute housing for chairs and homeless for who's left standing. And those are the two questions. Why some people? So what causes a short supply of low-income housing or housing of a particular kind? And why are some people left standing, so to speak, or homeless, uh, rather than others. I always like to say, uh, of course, universities and colleges live in an evidence-based world. Uh, sometimes, that's under question today in the world, but uh, so far we're still able to uh, move in that direction. So it's the intersection of two things. The, what causes the chairs to re be removed are structural factors. And by structural factors, I mean factors that have little to do with the biographic and characterological features of an individual. Uh, so the structural factors that determine which chairs are removed, or the, the shortfall in housing, and personal and biographic factors which determine who's left standing. So we ask, uh, I mean, this is self-reports, and they could indicate more than one. But these are the structural factors. 40% uh, uh, of the homeless indicated that we interviewed that securing and retaining jobs with sustainable wage was a problem. 36% uh, mentioned finding affordable housing. What about biographic uh, factors? 28% uh, mentioned family issues. 22, drugs and alcohol, 17, mental illness, 13, physical health, and seven, a recent release from prison or jail. Uh, so let's look at some specific factors that, uh, uh, ways to think about structural factors. Here we have a, a graph, uh, the green line indicates this is between, uh, 2000 and 2014, uh, the direction of median rent. So from 2000 to 2014 in the county, it increased uh, $3,600 plus. The blue is in terms of uh, adjusted uh, cost of living wages. It declined by $5,000. So you have this gap between the cost of housing and uh, monetary resources to access that housing. Homelessness grows in this gap. And it's not surprising that uh, you talk about San Diego, Orange County, uh, LA in particular, and San Francisco, there's this huge gap.
This also provides some insight to that. In 2017, for a fair market uh, rent in Orange County, two-bedroom, 1800 The annual income needed for that, uh, 72000 At a minimum wage, you would need 3.3 jobs uh, to be able to afford that. Another way to look at it, uh, you need to work 133 hours a week. Uh, in Orange County, the percent of renters unable to afford the fair market uh, rent, 60%. So this also provides some insight, again, to that gap between the cost of rent and the availability of resources to access that cost. Now, there is a question, and it's an ongoing question, of what, what does the state do, uh, as well as the county, in terms of the high cost of rent. But the other way to work, look at it, too, is what about income? So there was this uh, estimate of uh, jobs 2010 to 2020 in Orange County. Uh, and the ones uh, with a job increase, police and sheriffs, patrol officers, at that wage, but here are most of them, beneath the $20 level. I mean, these are all part of, for years, the part of the economy that has grown the fastest with respect to wages is the service sector not the manufacturing sector. That has declined for some time. But the major characteristic, or one of the major characteristics of the service sector, low-wage jobs. Uh, retail salesperson, waiters, waitresses, cashiers, food prep, laborers, janitors, and so on. So it doesn't look like there's going to be much help in terms of increasing the wage size, which means that if the rent still stays high, that gap will continue to remain. So this, this here kind of drills down and combines uh, the different factors. Because people get in arguments, oh, it's drugs, it's alcohol. No, it's the, it's the uh, cost of housing, uh, low-paid jobs. Uh, all of these things intersect or interact in different ways. So here, this is for, uh, we do this for women and for men. So what we found is that there are three clusters. And in this cluster one for women, 74%, the dominant factor in the cluster is the lack of affordable housing uh, and job loss. And, in, and you can throw in insufficient wages. It doesn't mean that these other factors aren't present. They're in combination, but these other factors are not nearly as influential as the job situation and the cost of, uh, cost of housing. So 74% for women uh, it's the lack of affordable housing and job loss that is important. Then there's cluster two, domestic violence for women, 21%. I mean, here, that in itself is a, you can see it's a prominent, a strong driver, 100% here. Again, you have mental health, physical health. And if you're a victim of substance abuse, a, a victim of domestic violence is also going to have some mental health repercussions. Uh, so that's one way these things interact. And then cluster three, where for women very small, uh, is alcohol and drugs. Alcohol, the point is, for, if you're a woman and you're homeless, the main driver is not alcohol and drugs. It's over here. And secondly, domestic violence. How different is that for men? Well, for men, you still have 55% here, 57% uh, 
with the housing and job situation is dominant. But then you have another category with family issues right here mixed with uh, drugs and health issues right here, but with family prominent. And then you have over here in the third cluster, uh, release from jail and prison uh, combined with mental health and, uh, and drugs. So the point is that not only are there different pathways, but different clustered pathways for falling onto the streets, but what that also suggests, it's a solution to homelessness, is multifaceted. People have different needs. And there's no one pathway to dealing with the problem. The major one, of course, that we see is the provision of housing, but these other things need to be attended to as well. Uh, and in talking about vulnerabilities, I just want to bring your attention to uh, the role of abuse. This is going back. Are some people, is their upbringing, is there, there, does one's childhood, certain aspects of one's childhood make them more vulnerable later on to homelessness? Well, here we see a pretty strong relationship. Uh, the yellow is the total uh, red male and orange female. Uh, physical abuse, uh, the total 17.9 uh, per three, uh, 18 percent uh, as children uh, were victims of physical abuse. Uh, about two and a half percent sexual abuse only. Uh, 11.5 percent uh, of combination, but if you add them all together, you're up over 30 percent. Experience some kind of abuse as children. And we know that's very traumatizing. And if that's combined with some of these other things, you're talking about vulnerability. Some other questions. Uh, what percent uh, experienced physical and sexual abuse during childhood by a household member? Well, 26% for men, 40% for women. So it really accentuates the vulnerability of women. Percent who cited domestic violence is a reason uh, for their homelessness, 24. And then among women who cited domestic violence is a reason for homelessness, what was the percent who also experienced physical and sexual abuse during childhood? 58%. It seems like there's a strong correlation between if you've experienced abuse as a child, for women in particular, and domestic violence later on. Uh, but again, what we're talking about uh, are a few factors across the life course that increase one's vulnerability to something like homelessness. A couple other factors, 42% uh, uh, over here uh, had a parent or adult uh, household member with alcohol or drug problems growing up. 42% of the homeless we interviewed. 14% a family member who had been homeless for one night. Any of you ever been homeless for a night? One person. Uh, time living with uh, non-parental relatives, so foster parents, orphanages, 25%. And, I mean, that's incredibly high, 25%. Uh, spent time in juvenile correction, uh, 6%. So again, we're looking how some of these different factors intersect, uh, particularly in terms of childhood, that increase one's vulnerability to the experience of homelessness. I didn't say determine, but increases. So with that as background, let's move to the uh, question of the cost of homelessness in Orange County. So 
what we, what we did, uh, you know, it's, it's always the case when you send out questionnaires, uh, some of the targeted uh, interviewees uh, respond and some don't. Of the 34 municipalities, uh, 21 responded. Uh, they were the, the largest ones. Uh, 13 of them did not, but we imputed uh, estimates. Hospitals, not too many hospitals responded, so we, our data on hospitalization, emergency room care, uh, came from what's called OSFED, which collects data and all of that for the state and on a county basis, and we got that information. And from other sources, from the county, and then the housing agencies, they, again, of those, uh, we uh, sent questionnaires, uh, housing agencies, 20 reported, 21 did not, and then other agencies. And so when you add it all up, our estimate, which we think is probably, is basically 300 million uh, for 2015-16, the cost of homelessness in Orange County. We suspect that's a, a somewhat of a conservative estimate. Uh, but then what are the, the major kind of uh, clusters? And here's the, uh, the health care is the largest with housing right beside it, and then law enforcement. And the law enforcement estimate is conservative because we didn't have uh, data on parole and probation, and that would, uh, that would add to it. But I met, I've mentioned health care several times here, and uh, this is what the estimate is. For, I just show you for the, uh, the question, since the inter hospitals didn't respond, uh, one did, but uh, uh, we needed uh, the estimated cost for most of them. So Cal Optima provided the estimated cost for uh, emergency use. This is for ambulance services and uh, of the hospital inpatient here, and you add all that up together, uh, and this gives us our 120 uh, million. Now, if we look per person, based on our, what we know the cost were, from the hospitals, emergency rooms, uh, ambulance services, and then we take the data we got from inter our interviews with the homeless and how many times, what their experiences were uh, with emergency rooms, hospitalization, and so forth, and other costs. This is what our estimate per head was for the chronic street people, a cost of $100,000 a year. Now you look at that and you say, my gosh, uh, we could do better than that, couldn't we, if we put them in housing? And neither the non-chronic, which are considerably less, but still 42,000 a year. So that raises the question that we wanted to get at and that we were contracted to investigate a kind of, well, how does that compare? And so, it's kind of like, well, which way do we go? There's this Housing First model, which was developed federally under George W. Bush. Uh, prior to that, the, the approach was quite a, a, a transitional approach, where before you put people in housing, you had a drug problem, an alcohol problem, health problem. You had to take care of those problems first. And then it came to the realization, no, you've got to get people in housing and off the streets. And so the housing first model. So stable housing and support uh, services, get them off the streets as quickly as possible. And so over here then, I mean, we kind of have a, a number of hypotheses, some expectations. 
that there will be a decline in hospital visits and stays. There would be a decline in contact with law enforcement, a decline in time on the streets, and a noteworthy decline in the cost of homelessness. So what did we find? What did the research reveal? Well, first, was there a decline in terms of uh, contacts with criminal justice, hospitalization, and so on? I mean, just something here, and we're comparing chronic street with permanent supportive housing, uh, a huge decline in terms of just use of something like soup kitchens. And in permanent supportive housing, they have their own little kitchens. Uh, times in the emergency room, cut in half. In permanent supportive housing, I mean, these are people with multiple health conditions, so on occasion, uh, they're going to need to go to emergency room. But that's cut in half. Times in ambulance, uh, cut in, more than cut in half. Uh, here you have, oh, time the inpatient, cut in half. Times accessed other health services, well, it increases because, but it's not the expensive ones, like emergency rooms and hospitalizations. The reason for the increase is these are people, again, with uh, multiple health problems, so now they can be in contact. Uh, you know, it could be with primary care physicians, other health services, uh, the sorts of things that uh, are, help prevent emergency room treatment and hospitalization. Times ticketed by the police, look at that decline. Times arrested, eliminated. Times appeared in court, in a holding cell or jail, in a shelter or emergency room. So according to our expectations, Housing first, putting people in, and comparing those on the street and those in permanent supportive housing, it certainly makes sense in terms of uh, these different kind of experiences. How does it add up dollar-wise? Well, these are, this is for the non-chronic. So these, these are folks that haven't been on the street, but a year plus, uh, uh, and don't have disabilities, 42,000 a year just living on the streets, put them in permanent supportive housing and dressed to 9,000 plus. A huge cost savings. And look at, look at this for the chronic homeless. The drop isn't quite as significant, but it's still cut in half from 100,759 a year to 51,587. And these, this is for the upper 10% or decile of the chronic homeless. So this would be like the gentleman who, the picture of the gentleman in the wheelchair and that I talked about. For people like that, the average cost of living on the streets for a year, 439000 Why? Because they have these. I mean, th that gentleman had heart problems, uh, high blood pressure, uh, phlebitis. He couldn't walk and other things. And you add all of that up and the and not only the emergency room visits, but the hospitalizations. So these people become very costly. There was an article several years ago in the New Yorker called Million Dollar Murray. Million Dollar Murray was a homeless fellow in Reno, Nevada. Uh, a police officer got to know him very well. He was a chronic alcoholic, but the estimate was that Murray cost the city a million dollars a year. In and out of emergency room, detox. Well, we have our million dollar Murrays in Orange County. Uh, and it's not all alcohol. 
and any, it's a combination of health factors that, uh, that escalate. If you house that person for services, it's 55000 a year. A huge discrepancy. So here again, you can uh, kind of the average cost per person for health service utilization. Uh, for the street homeless, the majority of the costs are in uh, health care. Uh, some for the non-chronic shelter, but how that declines when you put people uh, in other kind of housing facilities. So I have some questions here, some takeaways when we think about homelessness. Homelessness is a situation people find themselves in uh, rather than a characteristic of the person studied. It's a social condition rather than a social type. The primary cause of homelessness for both women and men is a gap between the cost of housing and the availability of living wages to access that housing. So the homeless are generally people for whom there are no available accessible housing slots because of the intersection of the structural factors we talked about and the personal and biographic vulnerabilities. A fourth major finding, the cost of homelessness decreases markedly with the provision of housing. And this is especially so among the chronic homeless. And many of the troublesome issues, actually most of the troublesome issues associated with homelessness disappear with the provision of housing. You know, when there's a, a recommendation to build some kind of housing unit for the homeless in a neighborhood, people get up in arms and you have the NIMBY response, not in my backyard. What is it they're opposed to? What are they concerned about? The appearance of the homeless? Uh, their smell, uh, the presumption that they're all using drugs, they're all alcoholics, and they're all going to be hanging out in the streets. But when you put people in housing, all those things decrease markedly or disappear. So why not housing first? And let me give you some examples of what this housing looks like uh, so that there's really no need to be, I mean, the characteristics that might be associated, we're not talking about shelters here. This is a housing unit uh, in Irvine. I mean, look at it. We'd all be fine staying in that. Uh, wait a minute here. Well, here's the, yeah, the, uh, so this is a ho another housing unit in Irvine. 134 two and three bedroom family apartments. It's kind of what the kitchen area looks like. Uh, that's not the, the living room. This is a, uh, you know, kind of a, a general reception area, yes, thank you. Uh, when people, when, when Jamboree Housing has taken people by this, they had no idea that it even existed because there's nothing objectionable about it. And when the, the homeless, there's no need to go out in the streets. They have their own kitchens, a bedroom, and a bathroom and a place to wash their clothes. And here's another uh, unit uh, in Irvine for seniors, 55 and... Uh, where, where did that idea that uh, 55 was the benchmark for seniors? <laughs> How many in here are 55? 
I can't even raise my hand. Uh, I was just curious. I remember my parents lived in Florida for a while, and 55 was the, uh, the cutoff age. And I was curious then and still curious. What is it about 55 that makes one a senior? I think probably that's gone up to, uh, up to day. But anyway, you look at these places and say, good gosh, we'd welcome them in our neighborhood. So I think I'm pretty much on schedule. Uh, let me stop there and say thank you. And uh, I hope you've learned a good bit about homelessness, maybe more than you want. Uh, but that's the danger of uh, having a researcher come in and talk to you. So Thank you so much. Just a second. Let me get your mic. I just want to adjust it, put it down here. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're better. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sloan. Let's give another round of applause. Very helpful information. I love the data, don't you? That statistics. Oh, boy, I've learned an awful lot today. Um, we want to have time for questions. If you want to raise your hand, and a mic will come around to you. Here it comes. They're coming down. Just, just be patient. Let's start right over here with Tony. Go ahead. Uh, last month, Many of the major newspapers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, The Economist magazine, pointed out that within the next 10 to 15 years, one quarter of the present labor force will be out of work due to robotization. In other words, the housing problem is going to increase. Would you care to comment, comment on that? Well, I, yeah, I mean, you kind of summarized it. It's, a, it's an estimate. Uh, but uh, I mean, we, we, what do we do about that? One thing is, is if we have to retrain people. I mean, I think we're living in a moment, uh, uh, certainly in the developed world, uh, it's, not, it's not like first time industrialization when there was a huge traumatic change uh, in the economy of the world, but it's not dissimilar uh, in terms of uh, computerization and in terms of uh, jobs being turned over to that and taken over. Uh, you know, much of the manufacturing uh, is now done, is what you're pointing to, uh, by machines. And this is this will continue to escalate and uh, can lead to an escalation in certain kind of crises. So part of it is job training. There's no question about that. I mean, it's a similar sort of thing that you hear about the debate about coal mining. Best thing you can do for the coal mining industry is retrain people. Uh, as long as the economics of... Uh, of resources, uh, natural resources, uh, environmentally friendly resources uh, moves in another direction, then coal mining's uh, not going to be what it was at one time. So what do you do? You can make promises, but the best thing you can do is retrain people. Hmm. And so we need training programs. It's not mean everybody goes to college, not everyone has to go to college. That's not what we're talking about. But find other ways to, it's not just fitting people into the economy to be economically productive, but also to feel so that they themselves can feel productive and feel better about themselves psychologically. Right down here. Okay. How are the lucky few selected for, these housing, for this housing? Pardon? How are the lucky few selected for this housing? Oh, very good question. Uh, it's kind of complicated. Uh, the federal government is a, this, the, a program called coordinated entry. And ideally, homeless are supposed to go through this program. And they have to take, uh, well, it's a, somebody interviews them. Uh, it's, 
It's an uh, answer questions with respect to their health and situation that give them a vulnerability score. And if uh, I forget what the range is, it may be up to 12 or 16, but if you're an eight or above, then you're eligible for permanent supportive housing. The problem is there's many more people who are eligible than there are housing units. And, you know, whether or not that's the best metric, I mean, there is a problem. Uh, I would have, that gentleman in a wheelchair, I would have loved to have put him in the car and taken him someplace. There was no place I could take him. One, you have to go through this system, but even if you go through it, it's not a guarantee that there's housing that's readily available for you. And that's part of the problem. Not only more housing, but also the pathway into that housing that can do it uh, to make it more efficient and effective. Up in the back right over here. Yep. Um, my question is, how is the cost of the housing included with all building the buildings for it? And is there any rent for the person? Yeah, there's there? rent. Uh, for instance, if you're in permanent support, in all of these housing, there's rent. Uh, and it's configured on, you know, if you get Social Security, what the Social Security is. In the permanent supportive housing, uh, initially you get into it, you're provided with uh, uh, first months in deposit, uh, but then you're expected to uh, pay a proportion of your earnings. Uh, and that's true for transitional housing, for rapid rehousing, uh, permanent supportive housing, some work, not the majority, but if they're getting government benefits, uh, they're expected to, uh, a portion of that uh, is, goes into uh, the subsidy. The cost of housing, is, yeah, it includes, uh, includes everything. Of course, most of these units, they're already, they're already constructed. Where were, what, what the, uh, this keeps, uh, yeah, the, uh, what's going on right now in the county? There's this campaign called United to End Homelessness. Uh, it's led by United Way but it's a coalition of uh, nonprofits, uh, the business community, or for-profit community, the faith-based community, the educational community, and the governmental sector. And the initial plan, based on estimates uh, of homelessness, is by, in about five years, to have built 2,700 new units of permanent supportive housing. That campaign's going on. Uh, whether or not uh, that will happen remains to be seen. Uh, the biggest, the money will come from uh, the state, from the federal government, and from foundations and donations. Uh, the, the sense is that the money will be there. The challenge is, the biggest challenge is for neighborhoods to re, be receptive to the kind of housing units I showed pictures of. What the county's done is for the 34 municipalities, they have three sec sections, the north sector, the central sector, and the southern sector, which is uh, Laguna Woods, is in. And the idea was to distribute these proportionally according to population size. Uh, you know, this, whether this will happen or not, I don't know, but this is what's going on. So there is this United to End Homelessness campaign to come up with some money to construct housing units, uh, the permanent supportive housing units. Question up at the very back. Uh, thank you for your presentation and your hard work. Um, a year ago, uh, the LA Times reported that there's $2 billion that was tagged for homelessness 
and the, the accusation was that it wasn't being used, and I just wonder if that's taking place yet. Well, that, I mean, I can't tell you definitively, but that's often a problem. That there's money there, and it doesn't get used uh, uh, for what it was intended. Uh, there can be any number of factors why that's the case. Sometimes supervisors, uh, uh, council people may, well, they reallocate the money to something else. I don't know in this particular, uh, particular case, but I know what you're talking about. Right down here. Many of us travel, uh, and in traveling, meet people who live in the countries like England and, and France. And the young people in France, the young school teachers, the people starting out, are living three and four in an apartment, a small apartment. It's not like America. In America, we raise our children to expect so much for li so little. And I recall being young and thinking not of how much space and all the money I could spend on gadgets and stuff. We have to retrain our children to what's correct, what not correct, but what counts, and maybe expect a lot less. And maybe that would help people, but, the problem is our, um, our population is going to double within the next 20 years. If our population doubles, there isn't going to be enough space in order to live. So I don't know what the answer is. What do you find the answer? Well, you're let me first say I'm glad you can recall uh, your childhood. Uh, <laughs> some <laughs> Sometimes I think I can, but I'm not always sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right that in this country uh, we have much more space or square footage per person than really any place in the world. Uh, you know, whether that's a good thing or not is an argument uh, one can have. But I will say that uh, one trend that we've seen here and elsewhere is more young people and even college-educated folks moving back home. Uh, one, because uh, they, they may not have the job yet, or even if they do have the job, not at the income level that enables them to get in on their own uh, an apartment unit. So. Many of them do double up, uh, but also more of them uh, are returning home to live. So, so far, my three children haven't done that yet. Uh, I mean, the youngest is 40, but uh, uh, the door is locked, but I would open it. <laughs> Back right over there. We got, I see a lot of hands, and well, we're getting to you, okay. trust me. Um, my question, in my 50 years in Orange County, I've seen ample opportunities for us to solve the homeless problem, and for some reason we have chose not to do it. Specifically, we've had four or five military bases that were self-contained units. They had recreation, they had dorm rooms, they had enough to take care of a Marine, and I don't think the Marines or the Army people or the Air Force people were abused so the, those, that land sat there in nice locations, lots of land to build and lots of land to use, and in my uh, understanding of it, it would have solved the homeless problem on those bases. Now my question is, why didn't we do it? Well, I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. Uh, Nobody does. Yeah, well, the, yeah, much of the land, you can say the. Of course, somebody said the value of the land. Uh, in no, they sold that. They sold that land to developers who build homes. Yeah, right. It's land. All right. Let's have another question right over here. Yes, sir. Yes, I was. You, 
you added up the cost of the problem of the homelessness, which is probably a doable thing because you're, you're taking it from statistics. Well, how many homeless people are there in Orange County? And that affects your $100,000. Yes. Uh, every two years, uh, the county is required to do this point in time estimate. Uh, actually, every municipality or county that receives federal money relating to homelessness is required to do that every two years. So the point in time estimate uh, for 2000, the last one was 2017, the 2019 one was just completed in January. And the, not all the data has been released, but uh, it's being released, and maybe about two weeks ago uh, in the Orange County Register, it was reported that there was a, approximately a 2,500 uh, person increase in the number of homelessness in Orange County. So it's right up close to, right up at 7,000. Uh, those were the ones that were counted. Uh, I didn't see yet the proportion of those that are chronically homeless. But if, you, if all of that's right, and we take our estimation procedures, uh, so the cost of the, to the cost of the county wide uh, would probably jump up closer to 400 million. Right down here. The Housing Act of 1937 with the Brook Amendments where the family contributes 25% of their income was more. Now, the volume's good, you need to speak slower. The Housing, the housing Act of 1937 created 2,500 housing authorities across the country, and with the Brook Amendments, the, the, fam the families contribute 25% contribute of their income. Reagan modified that to 30%. Now we have, just within the last 10 years, we have the vouch, which is with the Housing Authority Section 8, which was 23. Section 8 says review is once a year. Now we have the vouch for military, and they're reviewed once a month. So now, does this DORA apartment housing, oh, there's also on top of that, there's 236 housing, which non-profit 501c3s non become their own private housing authority under the same formula as Section 8. Now. Looking at this DORA housing apartment, is the taxpayer getting a bigger bang for their buck? We have some very informed students here. Yeah, it looks like you've, <laughs> you've been involved in housing. Uh, is the taxpayer getting uh, bang for the buck? Well, compare the cost of leaving them on the street and how it's less than putting them in housing. Uh, pardon? Section 8 housing. Well, they can use, they can use Section 8. Uh, the problem with, with Section 8 is that a uh, good many uh, owners of apartments don't want to accept it. And that's a real issue. I see the question over there, but let me just go right over here first. There's someone back here. Yeah, go ahead right there, ma'am. I saw an interesting story. Um, uh, just coverage on a television station that showed us how that what they were doing with a lot of the um, families that are have no longer are, are single women with children who have to go to work so leave their kids around and creates a lot of issues a lot of problems and issues for children who are not being really taken care of because the parents can't do it. They have to work. And what they did is they created, they created um, uh, an area of apartments, nothing luxurious, but all these people had very similar issues. And so they created a whole program of, uh, of, take, of um, places where the ch Mothers can bring their children, be cared for, fed. They come back at night, and then they pick up their children. They have teachers there. They have all kinds of things that bring up the whole level of the 
life of the children. A lot of children are having reading problems because there's nobody that sits and reads to them. Just a lot of issues. Now we have a lot of people, children who have physical um, uh, problems like autism and some others. There's, I've never seen so much of it as I'm seeing now. And there's very little that you can, that a, an average person can afford to get as far as services to help raise up these children. It, and then we go and pass a big tax uh, cut f for people earning, yeah. you know, what, what is your question? $800 million a yeah, year. Yeah, there's a lot of problems out there. What, what is your question? I'm sorry? What is your question? My question is why are we not taking actions to really help people who are good people, but they need help. And they okay. need to live in a place Thank where you. their children are not being. Thank you. You're, you're asking, how, how, why aren't we doing more? Is that what your question is? OK. Uh, your answers to that are probably as good as mine. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, part, it's partly a question of public will and interest and uh, where we want to put our resources, and also making, uh, making sure that people with various kind of needs know what kind of opportunities might be available for them. I mean, one of the things with respect to the homeless is that when there are resources that might benefit them, they're not aware of them. So how do you get the word out to people? Thank you. There's one more question right here. We're running out of time. Uh, Dr. Snow will be up here for a few minutes to talk with you, but right there. I read all of your statistics, and I'm looking at that, and I'm seeing that there are 20 units out of 134. Of these units that you are looking at, and you're saying they're, they're mixed units, some for seniors, some for the other folks that are down and out. Um, I'm curious as to what they look like. This looks like before anybody moved in. What do they look like afterwards, number one? And number two, I know that in Chicago, in the housing, in bad weather, they start tearing up uh, any molding, any wood that's available so they can burn it to get heat. We're lucky here. That's a, that's a big factor that our weather is a heck of a lot better. What do they look like afterwards? Well, these, I mean, the ones I've been in look fine, and people are taking care of them. Uh, of course, there are, there are on-site managers, and some of the housing units that, I mean, if you're talking about, like, early on in St. Louis and Chicago, and these units now have been uh, torn down because they weren't working for some of the reasons that you noted, uh, here's an... We're not talking about the same number of people. Uh, and they're being, they're being managed and overseen. Uh, again, you know, the, there's an assumption there, perhaps, that uh, if you take some people from the streets, they're, gonna, they're not going to take care of the, of the unit. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. And there is, you know, there is training, too, and they have to be monitored. So in these programs, uh, even with rapid rehousing, uh, there are counselors, uh, you know, teaching people to manage a checkbook, to balance budgets, uh, how to take care of their place. So it's not just pe putting people in and letting them be. It's helping them to adjust and see where some of their shortcomings are and to help them out. I mean, that, that's a, the problem with some of the housing that you were talking about. Just put people in it and let it go and see what happens. And we kind of know what happens with some of those huge, huge apartment complexes. Obviously, this problem is a great problem, and something you're all very interested in. I really appreciate that. We obviously need to respond to that as a people, don't we? Thank you so much, for Dr. Snow, for your work for our community and for helping us here to understand it better. Thank you so much.